There's not been anything like this, a record setting. It was just put out that the United States economy added almost 5 million jobs in the month of June. Today's announcement proves that our economy is roaring back. It's coming back extremely strong. Welcome back to AM Joy. I'm Tiffany Cross in for Joy Reid. A stronger than expected jobs report has Donald Trump once again hanging his hat on the economy. In his drive to stick it to critics and the media, he tweeted a video montage, including our own Rachel Maddow, predicting a weak jobs report. Nearly 5 million Americans getting back to work is most definitely good news. But as the Lincoln Project reminded the president on Twitter, that's like dropping $20 on the floor and then picking it up again. The fact of the matter is tens of millions of Americans lost their job during the pandemic. This is the worst since the Great Depression. Nearly 50 million of them were fortunate enough to file for unemployment benefits, although the extra $600 some of them have been receiving every week will end at the end of this month. Senate Democrats are now fighting to get an extension for the enhanced unemployment benefits, but Mitch McConnell and team have already declared that idea dead on arrival. Do you know who's not worried about paying their rent or making ends meet with no job or having to shut down a small business for good? Wall Street. U.S. stocks just posted their best quarter in more than 20 years. Let's talk about that and more. Joining me now, Jelani Cobb, MSNBC political analyst and staff writer for The New Yorker and my friend. Anand Jahardis, visiting scholar at NYU and author of an amazing book, Winner Take All, The Elite Charade of the Changing World. I love your book. Bishop William Barber, my longtime friend, co-chairman of the Poor People's Campaign and author of We Are Called to Be a Movement, another very timely book. Thank you guests for being here. And Jelani, I'm going to go straight to you. One thing I find interesting about the labor stats that get reported, um, until recently, they mostly reflected white America. Uh, again, just now they've started reflecting the ethnic breakdown uh, of some of these numbers. So if you could talk us through what the job reports really means and what does the economic outlook look like for the black and brown communities across this country? So, I mean, I think it, it, we have to start uh, from where we were a few months ago. Uh, and, you know, the conversation that you heard then, the case that was being made uh, from the Trump campaign, the Trump administration, uh, was that uh, this was the lowest uh, unemployment that African Americans had seen in decades. And it went on and went on and went on about that. Uh, but just like everything else with the pandemic, where the pandemic exacerbated fault lines that were already uh, there, if you cared to pay enough attention uh, to actually see them, you know, what they didn't say in that was that black unemployment could have a historic low and still be about 33 percent higher than white unemployment. Uh, and so what you've seen is simply that disparity be magnified. So now we're talking about unemployment that is about 50 percent higher. Uh, and so in the best of times, that gap shrinks down to about a third higher. Uh, we often see black unemployment as much as double what white unemployment is, particularly in particular categories. And so that's not shocking. <laughs> That's not news uh, to anyone who's actually been paying attention to this, but it is uh, kind of pointing to something that's much more difficult to hide now. So, Anand, I want to turn to you. I found an interesting tweet that you sent this week where you essentially said the people who led us into this mess will not lead us out of it. So clearly you have no confidence in this administration to lead us uh, out of these poor economic numbers. What does this look like? So let's say a Democrat gets in, in the White House in November. What does economic recovery look like when we're still battling a global pandemic and still dealing with the fallout of, of, of COVID-19? Well, first of all, the word recovery means kind of going back to where you were before. And I don't think anybody uh, except oligarchs can afford to go back to where America was before because America wasn't working for most people before the pandemic either. And, you know, on this July 4th and all July 4ths, if you want to understand what's happening in the economy, look at what's happening on race, right? So Mount Rushmore yesterday, the president is engaging in this age old game, which is selling white people the hooch of supremacy um, in the hope of getting them drunk so they don't notice that he is stealing their stuff and the stuff of black people and the stuff of all people except oligarchs who are doing the stealing. And what we've seen is a rhetoric of recovery, of paycheck protection of this and that, 
um, masking the reality that in this crisis, as often happens in crisis, the powerful have rushed in to commandeer the benefits of crisis. We saw it when Ruth's Chris, as you you know, reported, like got the Paycheck Protection uh, money. We saw it. We see it now with Black Lives Matter and a bunch of companies in America putting on, frankly, corporate blackface while refusing to pay black people more, hire more black people, actually change any of the tax avoidance they do that, that hurts marginalized people disproportionately. And we see it in the return to these economic reinvention committees uh, of Eric Schmidt, Bill Gates, billionaires being brought in to reinvent uh, the plutocratic America that has left us so vulnerable as a host to this virus. All right, let me turn to you, Reverend Barber. I understand that you don't think Democrats are doing enough either to combat this, uh, the, the economic fallout of COVID-19. Say more. Well, I don't think that in the Poor People's Campaign, over 2.7 million people joined our assembly a few weeks ago to say this nation, this nation has to move away from this neoliberal uh, concept and start looking at how we address 140 million people living in poverty. It's not a matter of Democrats or Republicans. All of us have to do that. If you listen to our political debates, you don't hear the word poverty. Um, I wish even as we were talking about in the midst of what must be done on, on July 4th is race and poverty. It's not, is it race or poverty? It's race and poverty. We must talk about reconstruction. When Trump, Trump gives this lie, it's the very reason 168 clergy are saying that, like, like Frederick Douglass did 168 years ago, we must expose the hypocrisy. That we, we have 40% of four people who make over four, made $40,000 and under will lose their jobs in the midst of this pandemic. Millions more will become poor on top of the already 140 million poor. We have still not provided essential workers the essentials that they need, living wages, sick leave, decent unemployment, rent protection, ensuring that their utilities can't be cut off. These are the realities. So you can talk about, as you said, you know, a few jobs he's claiming that have been recovered, but the economy is far from recovered. And there were people in, 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 in trouble before the pandemic. 700 people were dying a day before the pandemic. And what Trump has done and his allies, McConnell, has engaged in an unholy rebellion, revisionist history against God and ordained, God ordained justice, and has fundamentally undermined uh, uh, voter protection, policies to lift up the poor, he undermines health care, he undermines immigrant justice, and we must transform from that. And I agree with my friend, it's not about going back to normal. Normal was already struggle. We must go to reconstruction, a third reconstruction in this nation. Strong words from Bishop Barber. I'm going to go back to you, Jelani, because as Bishop Barber just highlighted, this pandemic really just punctuated the inequality that a lot of community of color have known for a long time. So to his point, I mean, he's really talking about it's not just race, but it is race and the economics of it. So there are a lot of disenfranchised white people in this country as well. However, I think when you look at the political landscape, some people no. in that community tend to be oh, no. MAGA voters. So how uh, how do you carry that message to people who may be, you know, class poor, but don't necessarily identify to communities of color? Sure. Uh, well, first off, I'll say one thing, which is that uh, I swore to myself a long time ago I was never going to speak after Reverend Barber again. <laughs> uh, and and yet here I am <laughs> making another... <laughs> making another futile attempt to say something uh, insightful after he has pretty much wrapped up the whole thing. Uh, but I will say this. I, I think that there is a real need to uh, to look at the populism of what Donald Trump said he would do in 2016 uh, and where we are in 2020. Uh, and some of this is explicitly racial, and uh, Reverend Barber is right. Some of this is about class exploitation. Uh, and people becoming cognizant. Uh, and so, uh, especially I, I, the best person to talk to about this is actually Reverend Barber uh, and what they've been doing with the poor people's movement and how people have been organizing across the country to create a kind of counter populism. We've seen this in American history. Uh, it's not simply uh, George Wallace as the legacy of populism, but Henry Wallace, 
uh, who was the progressive populist who brought in people of color, who wanted to fight against racism, who, who saw the, uh, the mutual uh, concerns between poor black people and poor white people, uh, and poor people of color and different backgrounds. And so I think that that is a legacy and tradition that we fall back upon on these, in this time. And I want to turn to you because I know in your book you, uh, you know, poke at these billionaires and, and declare that they really shouldn't be billionaires. But given that there are billionaires in this country, some have certainly tried to address the problem. Uh, Robert Smith has tried to help uh, small black businesses across the country. Is there anything that the extremely wealthy could and should be doing in this time period? advocating for the dismantling of their plutocratic privilege. Uh, if they are interested in lobbying for a wealth tax, lobbying for uh, anti-corruption legislation, lobbying for the kind of bailouts that actually serve poor people and communities of color and not big corporations, I would welcome them. But I, I, I think we can't only hold rich people and Republicans accountable. We have to speak for a moment um, about Democrats, because we're not just in this kind of weak recovery because of Republicans. There has been a, st we are in at least five crises right now, right? There's a health crisis, racial crisis, economic crisis, democratic rule of law crisis, and a climate crisis. And this is an opportunity, as FDR recognized, for really bold action, right? The rest of this conversation we've had today is a little bit depressing, but let's make it actually exciting for a second. This is the kind of moment in history when you can change things. History shows that. and. You have Republicans who just clearly don't want to do that, want to help their friends. But do you really have in Joe Biden, in Chuck Schumer in the Senate, in Nancy Pelosi in the House, do you have a bold, dramatic, inspiring, goosebumps giving vision? I'm not saying you're going to be able to pass it in the Senate, but do you have it? Do you have this being declared? Do you have people committing to big ideas that maybe they weren't for earlier in their career? Maybe they were, as Biden was, for employer based health care, but maybe they now realize that's a crazy idea given the pandemic. And do you have them reversing themselves? You know, uh, this right. America is hungry for relief, as the Reverend was saying, but it's also hungry for fundamental change right now. And I don't think milk toast uh, is going to feed America's belly. All right, I want to get back I to agree. Bishop Barber, but before I do, I don't want to make either of you follow Bishop Barber again, so I will ask you, Jelani, before going to Barber. Uh, so we have a new slate of progressive candidates who have won their primaries. So we've got Jamal Bowman, we've got Richie Torres. With these people coming in with this more progressive outlook on the economy, uh, you know, joining folks like the squad in Congress, do you think our legislative landscape will start to look different and speak to more grassroots people authentically? So not a, you know, a tagline in a campaign stump speech, but an authentic effort to reimagine America and put people who are living below the poverty line on more equal footing. <laughs> Yes, uh, and I say that guidedly, guardedly, because uh, I think that there are uh, other things that are at play as well. Which is that you know, there are still you know lots of moderates. The Democratic Party uh, is still uh, dominated by its moderate wing, uh, and you know progressives are going to need uh, the seniority and the connections to actually maneuver uh, to make things happen. Uh, you know, one of the things I think that is the best example of this, uh, you know, connecting it to the Fourth of July is the Freedom of Information Act, uh, which is a very important piece of legislation uh, that requires the government to tell you what, what you're doing. Journalists uh, use it. It's the most fundamental tool that journalists use when we're trying to get documents. Uh, and that document was signed into law on the 4th of July by Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, but the legislator who was uh, 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 Pete Moss, I mean, excuse me, John Moss, who was behind it, it took him a decade in Congress. He ran for Congress because he thought they needed to be, they needed to be a Freedom of Information Act. And it took him 10 years to get the political clout to be able to navigate that through Congress, Congress and get that to Lyndon B. Johnson's desk. So I think that it's possible, but we should be aware that this is a protracted struggle. The FOIA, I know it well as a fellow journalist. So, Bishop Barber, I will turn to you. I hate to put you on the spot, but I will tell you, I know a lot of people who are struggling this uh, Fourth of July weekend and a lot of people who feel like there's a lot of political talk and, and things are 
they're, they're, they're acceptable in the massive when you hear them as statistics, but when you hear the humanity of some of the stories that people are struggling with, if you could, what word would you offer people who don't know what tomorrow brings, who don't know if they'll be able to pay their rent or mortgage in July, who don't know if they're going to be able to feed their children? What would you say to the people who are in, admired in, in, in this time of struggle right now? Well, what I will say to them is what we've said. People like my dear friend Pamela Rush, who actually just died uh, yesterday from COVID. But what oh, she said is we need to be a part of this movement. She joined the Poor People's Campaign movement. She said we need to bring together black people and white people and brown people and red people and people of every race, color, creed, and sexuality. We have the power. For instance, in the southern state, there's 75 million poor and low wealth people. 26 million of them, 23 million, did not vote. But they often aren't talked to, as my friend said, politically. We need to have a vision that invites them in. We need to be about the business of saying we are making the wrong choices. Frederick Douglass years ago, in the middle of all the problems with slavery, said every attempt to blot out our progress must only embolden our agitation. It is in time for an emboldened agitation. We can have an economy that pays people a living wage. We can have health care for the uninsured and the underinsured. We can cut our uh, military budget so that, it, so that we can put that money in infrastructure and development. We can clean up our, our uh, climate. The problem is not what we can do. It, the problem is not scarcity of resources. It's scarcity of will. And it's time now for people who have their backs against the wall to say, if I got my backs against the wall, I have no other choice but to push them. All right. I, I think we're losing uh, Bishop Barber's audio there, but thank you, Bishop Barber. It's not scarcity of resources, but scarcity of will. Words to close the segment out on beautifully. Thank you, Jelani Cobb, Aninger Hardis, and Bishop William Barber. That was like coffee at an Algonquin round table. I can't thank you guys enough for that.